Yeah, thank you for that. And thanks for the information uh, about your roles. It just helps me to understand kind of who's who's turned up to help with the pitching. Um, and thank you to for those of you who took my calls over the last few days uh, while I was trying to find out what the issues are that you're facing right now uh, so that I could uh, tailor this session as, as best as possible. So when you um, when you you download things from our site or you book onto things, then often uh, you're asked to provide your phone number. Um, and sometimes I will use it. Uh, to, to call you and ask for your input. So thanks ever so for those of you who uh, who, who did uh, take take those calls and, and help me with this. So thank you ever so much uh, to everyone who's come along today. It looks like we have got quite a mixture of people, mainly senior and uh, middle leaders, which is uh, kind of where I've broadly pitched the, the content. Um, but we've also got um, some governors, support staff, uh, teaching assistants and uh, uh, teachers and others as well here. So those breakout rooms should hopefully be a really nice opportunity for you to begin to explore some of these ideas um, a little bit there. If you're in a group uh, watching this, then um, do feel free just to take this discussion offline uh, during those moments if you'd rather not uh, join in. Um, and as Sophie said, not a problem if you can't put your camera and your microphone on, but particularly in those breakout sessions, if you are in a position to do so, um, it really does kind of add to things. So staff well-being, this is a massive issue at the moment. And I have had so many of you uh, come to me saying, I'm really, really worried about my staff. Um, I, you know, I think there's a significant issue around kind of burnout, stress, anxiety, anxiety, worry, lots and lots of people who feel that, you know, staff are really struggling. Um, it's absolutely understandable. This is a notoriously tricky time of year uh, in schools in particular always um, and this year has not been a usual year so we're not surprised by what we're seeing but that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't be looking to proactively do things about it so I wanted to pull together just a few really simple ideas of things that are working in the current situation right now these might not always work but right now these are things that people are telling me are working well for them as always, with the things that I'm sharing today, take away from it what makes sense for you, adapt it for your setting, use what you think will work and ignore the bits that don't feel like a good fit for you. We're trying to meet the needs of a whole range of people here. We've got people who are working uh, in, uh, in nurseries and people right up at college uh, and beyond as well. So, you know, there's not a one size fits all, but I've tried to share some ideas you can easily adapt. Before I go into the four ideas, um, the first thing is my continual plea um, that you please look after yourselves first. So I have had a lot of heads and deputies uh, on the phone and email to me saying, I'm worried about my staff. What can I do to help them? And if you do nothing else, then the number one thing you can do to help your staff is actually to prioritize your own well-being. Remember that in all that you do, in all that you say, in all the, the ways that you behave, you are a role model to your staff um, and to your wider community, because this isn't just about staff, it's about the students and the families as well, and you are role models. So it can be difficult to prioritize our own self-care, but remember that when we do that, when we show that this matters to me, looking after myself is important, I'm going to make uh, the time, the effort, the energy to do that, you give others permission uh, to do the same, and you cannot pour from an empty cup. Um, I feel this is a point I labour and make far too often, um, but I couldn't start without first saying that. Um, and something just to think about, many of you in the room today are leaders and the buck stops with you and that can feel a bit lonely. And so something just to go away and think about today is who are you able to go to? Who is your support network? Perhaps you know other people who are in a similar role in another school or another setting who you feel able to talk to. Um, perhaps you make a good use of the um, education support network who are brilliant and who I just learned today offer supervision, which I wasn't aware of before. Um, and I'm gonna try and get some information from them about uh, that. So their counseling line is free. I assume the supervision comes with a cost, but I don't know. Um, I don't know the detail if anyone does know um, and would be happy to talk about it or their experience of using it do do put a note in the chat and we'll come to you later um, but yes you might make use of something like the education support partnership the other thing that I would be thinking about is how your governors can help you so I've had lots of governors speak to me saying we're worried about our school leaders um, we want to help 
we're not sure how. And sometimes actually having a, a, a governor um, as a listening ear, someone who you can talk to about the things that are worrying you and use as a bit of a sounding board can be really helpful here too. So those are some things to think about before we go into the, the four ideas. And sorry for getting on my soapbox, but you matter too, and you must look after yourselves first. So first, um, first things first, uh, the first idea of the four is about encouraging blocked downtime. Um, and this is an idea that I've been exploring quite a lot lately, which is about the blocking of our time. And those of you who follow me on YouTube uh, will have seen me share this idea recently. It's something I've been experimenting with in my own life. And I've had really good uh, feedback from a whole range of different people who've used this idea. Now, the idea of time blocking isn't a new one, but it's usually used as a mechanism for increasing productivity. So it's something we normally use in a work context where we say, you know, um, that I'm gonna block out this hour for this task. And for that time, I am gonna be indistractable. I'm not gonna be drawn off on other tasks. I'm on do not disturb. And I'm just gonna really focus in on this. And I've taken that idea because I like it and I've always found it very useful in a work context. Um, but I've looked at how we can apply that to our downtime because historically, I've been encouraging um, schools to look at things like communications protocols and saying things like after X o'clock, um, you know, we don't answer email, we don't expect to be available by phone, we're kind of on off duty mode. But um, that has limited effects at the moment where we've turned into this very much 24 seven culture more now than ever before. And actually there are all sorts of different times when we, we feel we might be needed and it is very difficult um, for us to step away. And it's always difficult for, for leaders to do that uh, in any case. And so here by blocking our time, instead of saying, you know, essentially we have working and non-working hours, we take focused periods of time and say, this is my downtime. So you might encourage still that kind of communications protocol, but what you're very specifically saying here is, I don't know, between the hour of seven and eight in the evening, for example, this is my focused downtime. So not just that email is off and phone is off, but that you're focusing this as kind of golden time. This is time where for me, I am focusing on family or doing things just for fun, just for me, um, and where I'm turning off not only work, but also the news, because the news is, although more positive now than it has been, it can feel a little bit relentless. So time blocking, this is something that can work for all staff at all levels, but really blocking that downtime and thinking proactively about what would we do with that golden time? Who are the people we would choose to spend that with? Or what are the activities that we would want to engage with? What are the things that we can do just for fun um, or as part of our personal development, if that is the thing that we find that we get enjoyment uh, from? Um, how can we spend that time in order to help ourselves to, to reset um, and to restore? In terms of making this work, there are a few things that we can do. One is about leading by example. So if we're suggesting this to our teams, to the line managers, to the staff within our school, if we're saying, you know, it'd be really good each day just to have half an hour or an hour, which is blocked out as, you know, your absolute downtime when you're completely uncontactable and you're focusing in on these golden activities, um, suggesting that you're going to do the same, letting people know when that time is for you. And it's important that people communicate those times so that other people know that they're not reachable at those times and letting people know what you would choose to do uh, with that time as well so in our house that is often if it's a day when I need quiet and I'm autistic and I often do need quiet I might be uh, playing piano or going and sitting in a window and knitting um, if it's a day when I can manage more peopling uh, then I might spend that time doing things like playing board games uh, with my children board games for us has been a really um, brilliant way of having downtime together as a family um, it's a it's a good way to kind of focus that time take the children away from their screens um, and get us focused on something other than the world at large. Um, we can encourage staff to make a commitment to blocking that time out. So when we put this actually in our calendars and we make a commitment to it, um, that can really help. And having that as a regular commitment, again, makes it more likely um, that we will um, be able to fulfill that commitment. Um, and when we tell people about any commitment that we make to anything, we're more likely to actually uh, kind of follow through on it. So encouraging staff to actually block that time, make a commitment to it and share it and tell people what they'll do. The other thing that we can do um, as leaders, as managers, is to take an interest in what our colleagues are doing in that time. And that also 
it sort of feeds into our other kind of five ways to well-being, one of which is connect. Um, and when we stop and we ask our colleagues, what do they do in that time? We're basically saying, what are your passions, your interests, your hobbies? What do you choose to do when you don't have all the other passions on you? And often this can be a really nice way to build um, rapport and relationships with people as well. It's also something I really encourage when we're looking to relationship build with children. It's actually understanding if they could do absolutely anything for an hour, what would it be? Where would they go? What would they do? Who would they be with? Um, and the things that people choose to do in those times can often tell us quite a lot about the things that make them tick and can really help uh, to build and cement those relationships. Okay, I'm going to leave that idea with you to take into your breakout rooms for a moment. And so the question here to discuss in your breakout room, though feel free to go off track if you wish to. Um, if you were to block half an hour golden time each day, what would you do with it? When do you think you might be able to find that little bit of time just for you or for you and your family? Um, what would you choose to do? So if you could chuck us into our breakout room, Sophie, and leave people to discuss that for a moment. Do feel free to share any thoughts, ideas, questions that came up in the chat. I am going to respond to any questions on this and other topics um, at the end specifically, um, but I am also very happy to um, yeah, share thoughts, ideas um, on the way through. Also brilliant always if you've got ideas of, of resources uh, and things that you would, uh, you would like to, to share. Um, and thank you to Laura who said that she shared my Give Yourself Permission video with her staff. So this was, um, I was leading a session a week or so ago with carers um, about their own well-being. And one of the questions that was uh, posed at the end was, as carers, how can we give ourselves permission to look after ourselves as well as the people that we're looking after? Because all the ideas in the whole session were about, you know, self-care. They're just saying it's very hard to give myself permission. Um, and so the, um, the video was really essentially a summary of my response to that question, which was that when we give ourselves permission to exercise good self-care we can actually flip that and look at it from the point of view of the people that we're caring for because in caring for ourselves we're enabling ourselves to be the adult and um, that the adults or, or children around us really need um, we're not able to fulfill that role as well um, when we're very tired or we're undernourished or we are um, very stressed and anxious so self-care is really important so we can be who we need to be to everyone else okay um, Jenny, we all mentioned how we miss social contact, even um, if working in schools, staggered lunch and breaks mean little contact. And actually, number three was going to be about connection, but I will bring number three to number two because I'm in charge and I can do whatever I like. So let's let's go with that. So, um, yeah, so point three, which now becomes point two, is around enabling connection and kindness. So when we were thinking about the, the four ideas that I think will make a really big difference to staff well-being right now, thinking about how how do we facilitate connection in the current climate has become really important. I think we maybe thought that when we returned to school and college um, that we would feel that sense of connection that we'd really, really missed when we were in that bigger period of kind of lockdown earlier on in the year and we all felt sort of isolated and maybe connected virtually, but, but not actually. Um, but what I'm hearing from colleagues in school is almost that it feels more lonely because you're in the same building on the same site as your friends, your peers, your colleagues, but um, either you're in separate bubbles and so you're not able to mix or just simply that you have so many other tasks now that you wouldn't have usually have had to do, which are taking up a lot of those breaks and lunch times. So you might be, for example, in your breaks and lunch, going and cleaning um, and making sure that you're keeping all of your students safe by, by ensuring that your space um, is kept clean and that you're meeting those requirements or thinking about, you know, extra organization of resources uh, and, and those sorts of things. So it seems that there are quite a lot of additional tasks that have come on board essentially, um, which take up time. So there's a real lack of connection right now. There's not the time or it's not safe to actually physically be together. So although we're back in sight uh, together, there is that feeling of isolation, that feeling of loneliness. So one of the things that as uh, leaders we can be thinking about in order to promote those well-being within our teams is thinking, how can we support connection between our staff members during these times? Um, 
And this will look different for different teams and in different settings and depending on what's feasible um, within, your, um, within your team. Um, but things that have worked well for other people, things that uh, ideas that have been shared with me, um, has been buddying up members of staff so that they might regularly call one another and check in with each other. Um, and this doesn't need to be that line managers are calling their teams, although there's obviously um, you know, a really good place for that. And it's important that we are checking in and making sure that our, our team members are okay. But actually, one of the things I've heard from many schools is that almost sort of slightly random assigning of buddies within the within the staff um, can work really well. Um, and just having someone pick up the phone and say, just calling to see how you're doing, um, and almost just sort of having the chance to shoot the breeze with someone who kind of gets it um, can be incredibly helpful. Uh, uh, you know, I've had really, really nice feedback about that. So thinking about buddying, uh, buddying colleagues up. Um, the next thing is around when we're holding our meetings, often they're happening online now like this. This feels very familiar to all of us now, doesn't it? Um, and when those meetings happen online, what we miss out on often is the chat before and the chat after and the little bit of silliness that might happen and catching up with each other. And thinking about how can we actually facilitate a little bit of that connection that would normally have happened. So we're often very very focused very very on task when we have these online meetings but thinking about how can we build into the agenda space for a little bit of, of connection um, and one of the things I've been thinking about here is how we can use um, questions to break the ice and connect people so in the same way that I might do if I was running a training session uh, with a few of you for the day we might start the day with a slightly um, sort of funny or searching question so we could break the ice a bit get to know each other a little bit those kinds of questions can actually work really well even in amongst teams who know each other relatively well just to get people talking and um, so in the notes I put a list of um, suggested questions here um, and you could do anything and actually asking different team members to come up with a question uh, each time can work really, really well, too. But things like if you could pick up a new skill in an instant, what would it be? What are you reading at the moment? What was your favorite band in school? What do you wish you spent less time doing? Although we might, <laughs> whether we want to ask that, we want to make sure we're happy for an honest answer. Uh, one I'm going to use in a training session I'm running on Friday. What is the best compliment you've received recently? Um, and what do you want to try for the first time in the year ahead? And I've put other questions in there. This is also something that uh, colleagues I interviewed recently for my podcast who were talking about restorative practice. They talked about having this practice of always starting a meeting with a question that everyone has an opportunity to answer and to feel heard by all colleagues, regardless of hierarchy. Um, and that really kind of yeah broke the ice and built that connection and how having that as a regular practice even in more normal times, um, they encourage that as something that had worked really, really well. So that's something that, that, that could, work, uh, could work well. Um, another thing that can help in terms of enabling that connection is thinking about um, where it's possible and safe to do so, perhaps sometimes walking and talking. So you might not be able to sit and meet in a room together, but perhaps um, for things like one-to-ones, you might safely be able to do that um, outside, perhaps having a walk whilst doing it. The other thing is that when we are talking about tougher stuff, um, or having slightly more difficult conversations that actually the action of, of walking alongside so we're doing but we're also not facing each other uh, face on um, can mean that those conversations are better facilitated and that can really aid uh, connection uh, as well. Um, some colleagues have said that there's been really good use of things like WhatsApp groups and other kind of group uh, technology. I personally hate them um, but I know a lot of people have found these to be really good ways to stay connected and um, so we might encourage colleagues to uh, make use of those those kinds of things I maybe hate them because I'm I'm a mum and so I end up in whatsapp groups of, of mums and mums are wonderful and um, but sometimes we have different priorities at different times in the day and I'm not too worried about someone's missing jumper when I'm trying to focus on writing 
for example. Um, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not great at those groups, but then I am also autistic and small talk's not my thing. Um, and I think WhatsApp groups really lends itself to that, you know, fun, small talk, touching in with people, which is actually the thing that many people are missing. So you might have ideas for how that might uh, work. Um, the other thing that some leaders have told me has worked well in their schools is thinking about actually appointing someone whose role it is to try and foster um, connection and kindness and giving them a little bit of time and a little bit of budget perhaps in order to think um, about how they might do this. It doesn't need to be a lot of time, it doesn't need to be a lot of money, um, but particularly if we ask some of our um, more junior members of staff, um, our support staff are often really imaginative about some of these kinds of things and we allow those ideas to come um, from within our teams rather than always dictating them from the top down and um, then that can often uh, be you know we can see some really creative ideas coming up through there. So um, let's have a, a moment again to our, our breakout rooms and thinking about how within our schools can we enable that social closeness that we're looking for um, despite physical distance. Um, what might that look like in your school or your setting? In faces, which I hope means that you're finding the uh, the breakouts uh, helpful. They're a real Marmite thing. Some people love them and some people hate them. But I think that um, I find them a useful thing when I'm attending. It's really nice to be able to explore these ideas and, and think about how it would work for you. And sometimes just helps us feel a little bit less alone uh, in our travels as well. Um, so um, we went in a funny order. Um, so we did first the first idea and then the third idea. So now we're gonna do idea number two, um, which is about enabling mastery. Um, if you um, have thoughts or questions that you want to share from your past breakout room, do pop them in the chat and we will come to them. Um, but now we're going to think about um, enabling mastery. So when we're thinking about how we promote staff well-being, one of the things that we often forget is that actually feeling good at your job and competent in your role is one of the key things that makes us feel good. So we have chosen to work within our profession for a reason and helping people to continue to identify with that reason and to feel that they are doing their role as well as they can be and that they're being developed um, and, and helped and supported to meet the changing needs of their role particularly at times like the moment can make a really big difference what i'm hearing at the moment from colleagues is that they don't feel this mastery and that's understandable so much has changed we're doing things in a different way than usual um, we are finding many schools telling me that behavior is a real issue at the moment um, for all sorts of different reasons but so uh, colleagues might not be feeling that sense of mastery if they are experiencing more low or indeed high level disruption uh, within their classes and the groups that they're working with. Um, and also there is just so much general uncertainty about what is happening um, with regards to things like uh, exams and so on and so forth. And there's not a, a blanket answer to that because I know we've got people from all sorts of different places attending today. And this is, is different in the different nations in the UK um, and different again in different countries. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty. And so it's difficult to feel that sense of mastery. Um, so we need to be thinking as leaders, firstly, about how can we we um, be agile in identifying the issues that our colleagues are facing what are the things that make them feel less good um, at their role at the moment and what can we do to be supporting with that um, sometimes helping colleagues just to realize that everyone else is facing the same challenges can actually help a little bit here um, and certainly um, we've run sessions where we've done things like bring together lots of senkos we had one in the summer um, Sophie will remember this we ran a, a, a kind of ad hoc session for senkos in the summer and just bringing them together and all these senkos suddenly realizing that all the other senkos were facing the same challenges and that they were all really struggling and not knowing how to make best use of their TAs when they came back they didn't know what to do about resources there with all these common issues and just coming together and knowing that other people were facing those same challenges instantly seemed to make everybody feel a bit better um, and that can help that sort of solidarity and that sense that we're walking alongside each other and facing similar challenges can help 
Other things that can help here is if we can identify where there is good practice happening within our staff and thinking about how we can cascade and share that, perhaps looking towards things like buddying, mentoring and coaching. Um, at the moment, it's important to acknowledge that more than ever, our existing hierarchies might not be the best way to look to expertise. So right now, some of the best expertise within your school, within your organisation, which will help staff to work out how to manage the current situation, will come from some of your most junior on paper members of staff. So people like your teaching assistants and your learning mentors, um, your other support staff, your school nurse, if you have one. These are the kinds of people who know how to support our students and indeed colleagues through the sorts of things that we're facing right now. So we might be looking to them for advice, guidance, um, a bit of coaching, mentoring and support um, for how to uh, approach the situation uh, right now. And it may well be through learning and sharing of resources and ideas from some of those um, support staff colleagues that we can enable um, our teachers, our leaders uh, to feel a bit more mastery in their role at the moment. Some of the particular challenges that people are, are talking to me about are not knowing how to support um, students who might be um, finding it difficult uh, being at school due to level, you know, higher levels of anxiety. Um, there's lots of loss, uh, separation um, and those sorts of issues going on as well. Um, and again, we are largely having to step into the breach and support students with those sorts of issues, which we might normally uh, refer on. So again, if we're able to give people a little bit more confidence in how they manage some of these conversations and these sorts of issues, um, that can make a really big difference. And you have that expertise almost certainly within your school already. It's just about finding it and finding an appropriate way to cascade um, and share that, that knowledge, that understanding. It can be helpful to actually formally audit or survey your staff to get a real feel for what the challenges are that they're facing, because I'm sharing, you know, the generic picture, the kinds of things that I'm hearing about, but it might be very different within your specific setting. Um, so it's really worth hearing from your staff what's going on there and making sure that when you do that, that you're hearing a genuine uh, variety um, of voices um, as well. And remembering that where we're trying to build knowledge and understanding of our colleagues, we don't don't necessarily have to do that in the way that we've always done it so you don't have to wait until your next inset day or until you've got a twilight session actually you know sending people a five minute video or recommending a chapter of a book or giving them uh you know a, a, the the contact details of a colleague who's very good at that thing and asking them to catch up on zoom these are all things that are really good CPD. CPD doesn't have to look like it always has looked, uh, if that uh, makes sense. And, and the other thing there um, is just to think really carefully um, as leaders about what you're going to do with that January inset day, assuming that you have um, that day set aside. Um, some people haven't worked out what they're doing with it yet. And don't panic if that's the case for you. Many people I'm talking to haven't worked out the answer to that yet. But some of you will have had this set in stone for some time. I certainly often will be booked ahead like 18 months ahead for a January inset. And um, if that's the case in your school, I would just challenge whether what you thought you needed is what you still need now. And if not, whether as a leader, you can be brave enough to say, do you know what, that's not the best use of that day. Perhaps what we need to do is talk to staff, find out from them what their challenges are, um, and perhaps think about using that time um, a little bit differently because things are changing very, very uh, rapidly here. The final thought there about um, enabling mastery and thinking about training and supporting and coaching and mentoring is just thinking about how can we hear from colleagues about what's working for them um, and if they've done things like accessed uh, good uh, training online or read a good book, how can they recommend that to each other or cascade what they've learned. So again, your staff meetings might not look like they normally would. So you might be thinking about what are the different forums um, for enabling that to to happen. So um, let's have a think about that. Um, and I'm going to put this out there for you as a, as a big question uh, for the, the, the last breakout room now is what are you going to be doing with your January inset day? What have you decided as a staff 
you feel is the very best use of that time um, and um, what might be the questions that are coming to mind about if you're not quite sure yet uh, what might be perhaps better use of that time so kind of just throwing some ideas around for that for that day it's a really good opportunity to really enable uh, staff to feel mastery um, within their role so yes share your ideas with each other on that one. Um, okay, so the last bit, and do please put any thoughts, comments, ideas, questions into the uh, chat box uh, if you have them. Um, there's a suggestion in there about having a staff meeting that's not about work, which, um, and the suggestion came from a TA, and I think that's this kind of thing that if yeah. staff uh, make those suggestions mm -hmm. and they come from the bottom up, really great idea. I'm not sure how well it necessarily goes down when we leave those sorts of things from the top, um, like how people complain about having to go to compulsory yoga uh, in order to try and chill them out and things. I think, it, you know, we sometimes just have to think about how we enable these uh, these ideas to, to come and facilitate and support uh, the, the things that, that colleagues tell us they want rather than, um, yeah, necessarily dictate them, even if we think that these, these ideas are good. It's, yeah, thinking how do we surface them. But I, I actually really like that idea of having a, a meeting that's, that's not about work, allowing people to, to connect. Um, so the final, the final of the four ideas um, is around uh, building in moments for co-regulation. Um, and this is based on the fact that at the moment, there's this kind of low level anxiety rumbling through everyone much of the time. Um, and what I am hearing is that um, students are uh, less well regulated. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of low level uh, behavior issues uh, going on in, in many classrooms, um, but that actually this is exacerbated by the fact that also the adults are not feeling great either. They are tired, they are stressed, they are anxious. Understandably, we are doing our best in really challenging circumstances, but it's really hard. Now, the challenge with that is that um, our brains are amazing things and we mirror the, the feelings, the behaviors, the, uh, the, the way that those who are around us are. So one of the things I'm always teaching people about how we can take a trauma-informed approach and try and support and calm children who are dysregulated is by being swan-like and appearing calm and thinking about our breathing and thinking about lowering the tone and the pitch of our voice and really coming across in that calm, supportive way. Because when we're calm, it helps to calm the child um, who we are looking to uh, bring their mood down. But the opposite is also true. And if there is anxiety amongst our children and anxiety amongst our staff, then we kind of butt off each other and our mirror neurons mean that things kind of bubble over and it gets very hard. So the idea here is basically leaning into our amazing neurobiology, which means that we can all regulate together if we do this proactively. So the idea is that we build into our day regular moments when maybe throughout the whole school we just take a minute or so to regulate and together we find that moment of calm this is the sort of thing that you can do in an assembly it's the sort of thing that you can do it doesn't have to be you don't have to be in the room it can be done virtually as well if you're leading assemblies virtually um, it could be done at the beginning of lessons works particularly well in transitions and it's about finding kind of routines and rituals that can be used just to bring the mood down just to find that moment of calm and this really matters because it when we're kind of you know our anxiety is rising and rising and rising just finding a moment finding a way just to reset a little bit and when the adults do that alongside the children it's really good in terms of role modeling but crucially it also helps to calm the adults down and that then means that the adults are more able to be that calm in control persistent consistent uh, being that the that the children really really need um, when we explain to colleagues that by actually participating in these kind of regulating activities these activities designed to uh, relax and calm us when they actually participate rather than just watch which is what can sometimes happen when we, we put these things in place actually it really benefits the 
children. So it helps to regulate all of us. So again, thinking as leaders about how do we lead by example, if we're doing things like putting in moments of mindfulness or perhaps using a breathing technique or even just having a few minutes of calm, quiet reading, whatever it might be that works for you um, and your students in your setting, whether actually we can lead that and engage with it too great role modeling but will also help you uh, to regulate yourself. A few things that uh, uh, colleagues have shared that's working well for them here is making sure that um, all classes, all staff learn a whole range of different breathing and relaxation strategies so that they can work out which ones they like. So um, it, again look to your support staff, they will have oodles of resources and ideas of different strategies here. So the kind of things they're normally using with your anxious or autistic children are the kind of things that all of us uh, can benefit from right now. Um, and they will have tons of ideas and probably lots of lovely resources they can share there. So look to them for these ideas. Um, you can think about having students lead some of these activities. So again, this is the sort of thing where sometimes students might even go and do their own research and come up with ideas of what you might do in that kind of calm five minutes or, or however you want to, to name it and when we empower students to lead those moments um, that can be you know really sort of a, a real boost for those those students um, as well but it can also mean that we're making sure that we are using activities that resonate with with the kids um, because they've led on it here. Um, uh, some schools I've been talking to have talked about having um, working walls um, or, or journals um, where students have recorded their own ideas of what's worked for them so that they're able to look back um, and access that uh, at, at different times. Um, and um, the other thing there, just, just slightly more widely around journaling, that's again something that can be a really useful activity um, for students is to have non-directive drawing, journaling or play depending on uh, what age range you're working with and even doing that for just a few minutes can often help um, to sort of restore calm and can be really useful for adults um, as well. We don't always have to have a focus there. Quite often um, that non-directive um, free writing, free drawing or free play can help us to just work through whatever's on our mind, even if it might not feel like it's necessarily taking us rapidly in the right direction. Um, that's something one of my colleagues at um, Great Ormond Street taught me was about the importance of not necessarily always understanding exactly what the outcome is of each activity we do and just trusting sometimes um, in the process there a little bit and that particularly when we build this in as a regular routine um, it can be really, really restorative um, for children and adults as well. Um, and then the, the, the final idea here was um, one colleague uh, that I spoke to this week talked about having a reset script um, that he used where he basically learnt um, particular words that worked well with his class and an activity that he would use if he felt that the mood was just beginning to tip towards um, not what he wanted. <laughs> so where things began to feel a little bit, you know, frantic, a little bit frenetic, uh, things were feeling a little bit less calm and we just wanted to re-find that uh, place of, of happy calm that would enable everyone to engage with their, with their learning and with the class. Um, and, you know, having scripts, having go-to things that we do, things that we say can be super helpful because in those moments when we feel like we're just beginning to lose control of the class, of the way that things are feeling it can be very difficult in those moments to do good thinking and problem solving and having something that we have pre-rehearsed and that we've tried before and that we know works can be super super helpful so again this is the kind of idea that we could look to share um, with our teams um, and that again helps with that other idea we were talking about before of having that feeling of mastery and just acknowledging that right now behavior is for many of our colleagues something that that feels they don't feel necessarily quite in the same uh, level of control of that they might normally hope to. Uh, a, a colleague said to me last week, it feels like every day is the equivalent of one of those really windy days when, um, yes, the children are always very high spirited for reasons I, I don't know. I'm sure there is a, a reason, but I don't know. So, um, that's the that's number four. So we had kind of four four simple ideas here. Use what you think will help you. 
um, adapt it, make it your own. And you will get notes on all this. I made notes while I was preparing the course and Sophie will send these all out to you. So the four ideas were encouraging uh, that blocked down time. So having that golden time each day and making sure that as leaders, we, we do that for ourselves as well. Uh, we thought about enabling mastery, making sure that our colleagues really feel that they're able to do their job well. And we're identifying what the challenges are so we can support them in that. Um, the third idea, although we did it in a different order, was enabling connection and kindness, thinking about how can we create that feeling of connection um, when people feel a little isolated in their roles right now. Um, and then finally, thinking about building in those moments of co-regulation so that we can just be resetting regularly and really kind of keeping that feeling of calm um, and control. Um, and my kind of final thought, final challenge for you all really, before we go into an opportunity for questions, is just asking you as um, largely middle and senior leaders here, um, but all people who are role models to the children in their care, what are the things that you wish to role model? And my healthy challenge always is when it comes to well-being and self-care, would you be happy for the staff in your team or the children in your care to copy how you're doing things when it comes to your well-being and your self-care? And if you wouldn't be happy for them to completely copy the way that you're doing things, just asking if it wouldn't be good enough for them, why is it good enough for me? And reminding yourself that you are a role model in all that you do each day. So sometimes we need to give ourselves permission to stop, to look after ourselves, to exercise that self-care in order that the um, staff within our team, the children within our care have a really, really good role model um, that they can copy. Do please um, pop your questions in the chat. I'm going to stay, uh, Sophie and I are going to stay now for questions on this um, and anything else that you want to, I mean, I say anything else, I reserve the right to not answer questions I don't want to. But yeah, feel free to ask your questions in the chat should you wish to um, and, um, and share any ideas you have too. If anyone has anything they would like to say, um, then again, you are more than welcome to um, unmute yourself. You can press and hold the space bar. Um, and the other thing is, Sophie, if you could just pop a link in a moment when people stop saying thank you and thank you for saying thank you, um, a link into the chat for any of you who would be interested in having um, a walkthrough um, um, of the, the website. Sophie's sister, Eliza, has specifically asked me to uh, let you know that she um, is available to walk people through the website for anyone who wants to have a look at how our online courses work, um, the new pathway courses that we have, which are kind of, you get a CPD certificate for three to six hours, depending on the course, and lots of people are using those for their inset days. Um, and um, yeah, and she can also set you up with a free trial for all your staff as well. So those um, would last through until after your January inset if you're interested. So yeah, if you wanted to be shown around the site, understand kind of how it works and get yourself set up with four weeks uh, of trial, then uh, the link is there and we'll send that through on the email as well. Okay, any questions or, or thoughts? Um, Angela is asking about the um, give yourself permission video. Yes, it is available. Um, Sophie, would you mind grabbing the link to that? So do you know where it is? It'll be on my YouTube channel and we can add it into the end of the notes, but do um, maybe pop it in the chat as well for, for the colleague there who was asking. I'm just seeing if I put it in. Yeah, I did put it in the notes. So it's definitely in the notes. Um, Oh, and thank you. Elaine had, Elaine had a walkthrough of the site today. So Elaine um, works with lots and lots of schools um, up in North Tyneside. And so um, Eliza wanted to show Elaine the uh, site so that she could talk to her schools about it. Um, we're really proud of the site. We've worked really, really hard on it. Um, and um, yeah, we now have about 130 different courses on there. So um, yeah, hopefully something for everyone. Um, but yes, so yeah, do, do uh, let us know if you'd like to have a look. Um, would love to hear ideas. This is Paul Fitzgerald. Would love to hear ideas as to how governors can help support staff well-being, um, especially senior leaders who are frazzled. I've literally today um, just commissioned um, a, a good friend of mine uh, called Julia, um, who does a lot of work supporting governors to look at the, the role of governors more widely, but specifically thinking about their role in terms of well-being. Um, my um, kind of first thoughts on this, so for governors who are listening in, the most important thing I think that you can do right now is be a listening ear. Um, 
often um and and leaders do correct me if you you know you have other thoughts on this you want to share often i think that it can feel very lonely um being being a leader um, and having someone who you know who will non-judgmentally listen and be able to you know hear your ideas and perhaps bounce those around with you can be um incredibly helpful um i would also urge governors who are tuning in actually to show their appreciation for um our school staff at the moment and particularly our leaders um, everyone's very tired many many um, deputies and heads who I've spoken to have not had a proper break since March and it, I mean I'm in awe of what you've been doing um, it's been absolutely incredible and I think just stopping to really say thank you um, is is very very helpful and the other thing I think that governors can be doing um, is holding leaders to account in terms of their own well-being so um, a school I coached last year, so pre-pandemic, um, the chair of governors um, actually targeted the head, who was one of those amazing heads of a primary school who did everything, every single job, and they targeted the head on learning to say no. And the chair of governors regularly checked in with the head teacher to say, what have you said no to this week? Um, and actually holding her to account in that way made her really stop and think about what she was saying yes to and what she was saying no to. And the really interesting thing about that was that in beginning to learn to say no and learning the art of delegation she realized how much capacity energy enthusiasm knowledge and skills there were within her team that she hadn't been taking advantage of before and actually she saw those who worked um, lower in the hierarchy than her really begin to grow so as she learned to say no and others stepped up and said yes um, it was actually beneficial to everyone um, so yeah, those are my, those are my opening thoughts, but, um, you know, I think that could be a whole session for another day. I mean, if I, I don't know how much interest there is from, from governors, but I would be really happy to either run or commission a session, um, specifically thinking about governor's role in terms of supporting, uh, staff wellbeing. Any more questions in here, Sophie, that I've missed? You're very good at, um, picking them up. So uh, I've not seen so many questions, just a lot of thanks and how useful the uh, training has been. Um, uh, Laura put in a uh, nice comment, but I think uh, could have some suggestion here. Um, she said, I have used an almost scripted journal and the child refuses to engage with this. I wonder if it was too directed. Yeah, so... <laughs> It's always worth being flexible and trying different things. So for some people, having something that's quite focused, where there's quite clear asks of them can help and can be a really good starting point. Others are much happier with something that is a lot freer. Um, I don't think there's a one size fits all. However, um, as I was saying before about the, the colleague from Great Ormond Street who taught me so much about the, the power of this sort of non-directive um, journaling and play um, that actually, yeah, giving a child a little bit more freedom there perhaps might work for that child. I think it's certainly worth thinking about. Always worth though, if you're gonna do that non-directive journaling or play, having a think about what some prompts might might be because it can be really terrifying being faced with a blank page or complete free reign to do something. Sometimes we don't quite know where to start. Um, and sometimes there it might be open questions or you might begin if it were play, for example, um, if I were doing play with a child, I might think about like acting out a typical day and then just seeing where it goes. Um, and often simple questions like, and what happens next? Um, or how did that feel? Or what did that look like um, can, be, can be helpful. But yeah, there's not a one size fits all. And I think it's worth being curious and explorative um, in those kinds of activities. But also remembering that what works one day or what doesn't work one day, actually a child might be more ready for on another occasion. Um, so don't think that just because it didn't work once that it's never worth revisiting. Finally there, talk to the child, um, find ways to communicate with the child at times of calm about what are the things that they like engaging with and, and how, you know, what, what feels good to them. Um, and, and that can help to give us some direction too. Any more? No, just a lot of thanks. Um, uh, buh, buh, buh. Laura also said I'm a governor and would be interested. So um, yeah. that's always good. Uh, a lot of thanks to the breakout rooms um, of the good discussions. Yeah. Um, 
I'm just having a look at how quickly our numbers have shot down, Pookie, and was wondering uh, if I should uh, survey everyone once I've sent out the recording. That's a good idea. Oh, yeah, I completely forgot I asked you to survey. Yeah, do that when you've done the recording. Sorry, that's my my bad. Yeah, no, that's no problem. It's just uh, I, I know a lot of people have a lot of things on uh, after five o'clock and mm-hmm. lots of people have had to shoot off throughout the majority of it. Um, and we just want to know how useful this is and if people are actually enjoying coming. Yeah, and do reply as well. Sophie will drop an email to everyone um, and, and let us know what was helpful and what other sessions might be helpful um, and that kind of thing as well. Do talk, We're real people. Talk to us, basically. <laughs> um, I'm just picking up here. Helen said that her SEMH governor did a course with the Carnegie Mental Health. Um, he regularly checks in with me to see how things are going. So that course will be, I believe, the e-learning for the Leeds Mental Health Governor from Leeds Beckett University. Um, I might be wrong, but that would be my assumption there um so for um i think it's about 50 pounds um and certainly many of the schools that i coached through the school mental health award um did uh, encourage their lead mental health governor to take on uh, to, to do that course and and many reported it to be very very helpful that's right so yes i've heard really good feedback about that and certainly i've worked extensively with leeds beckett and everything i've ever done with them has led me to yeah I, it's been good so yeah would would be really well recommended and that is a final thought actually i didn't say about governors um having a governor whose responsibility is to lead on on mental health and well-being and including within that staff well-being um would be um yes yeah, something i would recommend details of the course okay so it's the um leeds beckett uh university um mental health governor course i'll get a link and i'll send it we'll send it through on the email um because yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, you should be able to find it by Googling, but it'll be Leeds Beckett University. It'll be an online um, course for, for governors and it was developed like pre-pandemic. So very forward thinking online learning uh, back in back in those days. OK, any 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 final any final thoughts, questions, ideas? I think we're maybe there. OK, well, in which case it just remains to say thank you ever so much. Um, those of you who are still here, you win the prize <laughs> of um, yeah, more of your time taken up. Um, and uh, yeah, hope to see you again next time. Thank you ever so much for all that you're doing. And um, yeah, do keep in touch with us. Let us know how we can best support you. And um, we'll look forward to working with you again. Thanks ever so much. And thank you, Sophie, as ever, for your wonderful 